Okay. Two, two in. Oh, no, actually. Yeah, yeah, no, we'll do two in. Back to no power of hell, I think. Does it repeat the whole verse four? Mm. Nate, John, maybe you can shed some light. What does the slides do there at the end? <laughs> Is it repeating verse four twice, the whole thing? Yeah, I don't think we do. We don't normally. Maybe we repeat yeah, the no power of hell. Yeah, it felt like it was finished. Yeah, no, just, just go straight through. But do that, make sure you do that pause. Yeah. The one time when I was meant to go up. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't think I got it now. I thought it was just the first two verses we've said down. But yeah. I no, it's, it's only the last one that I tend to go up. But okay. look, half the congregation will go up and yeah. half will stay down. But the sure. question is whether they're meant to. What's the actual answer? You happy with that? Yeah, I think I think it'll it'll be good. Uh, let's just let's just practice the in between bits. So. I felt like it seemed really slow at the start, but it picked up. Oh, oh no, it felt too fast for me. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. all right. Okay, okay. <laughs> The other one is um here in the love of Christ, our standing D. It's like a D 
really sus. So if you just stay on the D, it's fine. Okay, we've got less than five minutes, so let's um, get on to the last one. So we don't repeat the chorus at the end. I reckon we could. I reckon it felt a bit of a weird down kind of from the verse. So you go. Um, it was down. Oh Lord, oh Lord. Definitely bring the stomp back in on that last one. Last one. Last 
Good morning, everyone. We're about to start uh, in about a minute, so if you could please make your way to your seats so that we can start on time for the folks waiting on stream. Thank you. For those of you still outside, could you please make your way in and try and um, come down the front if you can, please, because we've got quite a few people coming today, at least on the books. So. Uh, also, if you're in a family of, say, two or three and the seats aren't quite right, you can pick them up and put them together if you'd like. I think we almost have a quorum. Good morning everyone, my name's Dave. Uh, I'll be leading us through parts of today's service of worship, but we're blessed to have a number of other people who come up and uh, help out with Bible reading and prayer and so on. Whether you're a visitor or a regular, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I hope you find today encouraging. Uh, and also a big warm welcome to everyone joining us online on the stream. Uh, pray that you're uh, fit and well or recovering. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, if you'd like to know where the toilets are, they're in a brick building just around the back of the church. Uh, if you'd like to get to them, uh, you can either sort of go through the side door and down the ramp or around, or you can get to it through this door here, and we don't mind people going through there to do that. Uh, we've got a uh, crash room out the back, and uh, we don't mind a little bit of noise in here if you have little ones, but um, that's available there if you want, and you can hear the, the sermon and so on in there. Uh, there will be a few more uh, announcements later from Rohan, but uh, please, one other thing, let's continue to honour the agreement that we have with the government that lets us uh, run this service today. So I see everyone's doing a great job with the uh, face masks, and also we need to keep families 1.5 metres apart. Thanks, everyone. We do have one exception for people up the front here who are leading, but we put our mask on when we sit down. Well, here we are at part two of celebrating Easter together. Uh, my chocolate tummy's full, but I think I could fit in another hot cross bun or two. But health food aside, uh, we're gathered here today to celebrate something really significant. On Good Friday, we remembered how Jesus took all the, t the times that you and I rebelled against God and hurt each other. And he paid the ultimate price in our place. He died on the cross and was buried in a tomb. But he didn't stay there. Today we celebrate the ultimate miracle, Jesus rising to life again. The many witnesses who saw him and believed. And just what this resurrection means for all those who believe in him. 
The risen Jesus is literally living proof that we have forgiveness and that death is not the end for us. Come, let's sing together. And if you're not sure how the songs go, that's fine. Uh, just enjoy the music and join in as you're comfortable. Let's sing.
Father, we want to thank and praise you this Easter Sunday morning that Jesus is alive, that he's risen, and that he came back to life to give us life. We pray this morning that you'd help us to center our hearts and our minds on him and to give thanks to you for the life that's found in him. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take a seat. Well, can I add my welcome to Dave? My name is Rohan Pires. I'm the pastor here at Graceville Presbyterian Church. And it's great to have you with us here on this Easter Sunday morning as we celebrate Jesus and his resurrection. Uh, if you're visiting with us this morning, we love having visitors here. Welcome. Uh, we hope that you find this morning's service encouraging for you in your journey to get to know Jesus. And uh, we're here actually every Sunday at these times, 8.30 and 10 a.m. You're welcome to, to come and join us anytime. Uh, our kids' church normally runs, uh, it's a little bit more tricky today with the rain, but uh, it's normally running each Sunday for kids age 3 up to 12. And um, we also have youth ministries. There's a youth group on Friday nights. Uh, we have growth groups during the week. So there's lots of things that are happening in the life of our church to help people get to know Jesus and to grow in their relationship with him. Uh, a number of those things for our regulars are taking a break for the school holidays, which are now kicking off for the next couple of weeks. So growth groups and uh, Friday night youth groups won't be happening, along with tots and tunes, uh, for the next two weeks. Now, this morning for our service, uh, we'll be sharing in communion, the Lord's Supper, together later on. And that's a, an opportunity for us each to, to spend some time reflecting and giving thanks personally for what Jesus has done for us, for what his death and resurrection means. So if you're a follower of Jesus, if you have put your trust in him, uh, whatever church you, you're from, you're welcome to share in the Lord's table with us this morning. And uh, there'll be time to, to reflect on that later in our service. Uh, we're going to continue now with a time of prayer. And so Catherine's going to come and lead us in that. Thanks, Catherine. Let us continue our prayer with praise and thanksgiving to our loving Heavenly Father. 
in a hymn to God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life an atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in. Indeed, our Father, we praise you. We rejoice and thank you for the gift of salvation in Christ Jesus. Thank you for your deep love for mankind, love that is beyond measure, so amazing and so divine. All we can do is to bow and to worship you. We shout with joy, victory, 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 for Christ is risen. He has set us free from sin and conquered death. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no resurrection if there is no death. Jesus, you are holy and sinless, yet you came from heaven to earth and lived and walked among us. You were wounded, bruised, beaten, suffered, and died a horrible death on the cross at Calvary. By the power of God, you rose on the third day. Now you are seated at the right hand of God, and you will come again. Thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice for each of us. While we are yet sinners, you died for us. As churches around the world reflect and celebrate on this Easter Sunday, may we, each one of us, contemplate and give thanks for the priceless gift Christ has given. Thank you for your precious blood, Lord, for the forgiveness of my sin. Thank you for redeeming me from sin and darkness, restoring me back to right relationship with the almighty, holy God. I can now call you Abba Father. I'm washed by the blood of Jesus. In Christ, I'm victorious. I am an overcomer. I am a new creation. I'm complete and made whole and I am God's worksmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. We pray that many people will hear and respond to the good news of the cross, that they will come to faith in Jesus on this Easter Sunday. May they come and taste that the Lord is good. Lord Jesus, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Your presence is with us always. We believe that you care for us, Hold us fast with your mighty hands as we walk through life's struggles and pain. We confess that so often we run to others for support, rely on our own wisdom and intellect, and forget to bring those concerns first and foremost to you in prayer. Forgive us, Lord. Please bring us back and help us to seek your face and allow you to shine the light into those situations. We especially lift up those who are battling ill health, with mental struggles and those who are awaiting medical test results. Lord, may they not fear. Help them to stand on the faith that is richly deposited in their hearts. Please continue to impart strength and courage as they attend appointments and undergo further treatments. We pray for those who are looking for answers or breakthroughs in their specific situations. God, we trust you that you will make a way where there seems to be no way in the natural. May they continue to trust and to hope in you. Blessed and eternal God, you are our refuge, and underneath are your everlasting arms. We pray that you will hold us close as we look to the future with hope and with a calm assurance that you rule and reign in each of us as we submit to your Lordship. May your peace abide in us. Holy Spirit, sweep over us with freshness when the word is preached today. May our hearts be ready to receive the word with joy so that the truth will take root and produce blossoms and fruits that reflect the beauty of Jesus in us and through us. Risen Savior, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness and our confidence is in you alone. May we continue to reflect meditate and celebrate the power of the cross today for Christ is risen and he is alive forevermore. Amen.
So now we're going to read from the Bible, and we're reading from John chapter 20, starting from verse 19. So John chapter 20 from verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed, and blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Thanks, Tamsin. It'd be great if you could keep that passage open as we think about the meaning of Jesus' resurrection this morning. I'm going to pray as we come to reflect together on God's Word. So please join me. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your Word to us this morning, the Word that speaks to us that Jesus is alive and that he's risen from the grave. And so we pray this morning as we come to look at your Word, your Holy Spirit would open our eyes to see Jesus in all his glory, and that you would transform our lives through him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Lee Strobel, he was an award-winning journalist with the Chicago Tribune, and he was a strong atheist. But his world changed drastically one day when, out of the blue, his wife told him, for him, some very disturbing news. She had become a Christian. And it set him off on a two-year journey to prove Christianity wrong. It's portrayed in the movie The Case for Christ, if you've seen that. And in The Case for Christ, there's this great scene at the beginning of the movie where uh, Lee Strobel's journey begins. And he's having a conversation with a fellow journalist who's a Christian. And he asks him, if somebody wanted to do an investigation of Christianity, where would you start? And his colleague replies, if the resurrection of Jesus didn't happen, it's a deck of cards. Uh, Strobel says, well, are you sure you want to give me that loaded gun? And his friend answers, I'm pretty sure you're not going to be able to pull the trigger. And Strobel takes up the challenge. He interviews academic experts. He explores alternative theories to disprove the Bible's account of Easter. But eventually, in the face of, in his words, an avalanche of evidence, he was convinced that Jesus really did rise from the dead. He writes in his book, The great irony was this, it would require much more faith for me to maintain my atheism than to trust in Jesus of Nazareth. And so that's what Lee did. He gave his life to Christ, and ever since, he's been helping other people to do the same. Now, in our passage this morning that was just read to us from John chapter 20, we meet another demanding sceptic, a sceptic who had his doubts dispelled and his life transformed by encountering the risen Lord Jesus. 
His name is Thomas, or Doubting Thomas, as he's infamously become known. And we read here also of two other appearances of the risen Jesus to different disciples, other close disciples of Jesus. And John writes all this stuff down in verse 31 to help us readers believe. Believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So I don't know what brings you here to church this morning. Maybe you're a a skeptic like Thomas. Maybe you're a believer who's struggling with doubts, as we all do from time to time. But let's take a look at John chapter 20. And here we're going to see two big implications that the resurrection of Jesus has for each of us this Easter Sunday morning. Firstly, the risen Jesus turns fear into peace and joy. Uh, To set the scene, it's Sunday morning, a couple of days after Jesus' death, and spare a thought for his closest followers, and their whole world has fallen apart. Three years they've invested in this Jesus guy, following him everywhere, uh, watching him do incredible things that they thought proved he was God's promised Messiah. But their hopes were dashed after he was arrested and beaten, tried and crucified like a criminal. Now, where to next for these guys? You can sense they'd be feeling so lost, so betrayed by the one who'd promised them so much. That was until a few of his closest followers, Mary, Peter and John, they went to the tomb earlier in the morning only to find it empty. No body, just strips of linen. Mary claims Jesus spoke to her, saying that he's alive. I'm sure all the disciples would have been sceptical until verse 19 of our passage. On the evening of that first day of the week of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. So the mood in the room was, what are they going to do to his followers? They're so afraid they've even locked the doors. And into this situation enters Jesus, their saviour. He miraculously passes through the locked doors and he stands among them. Uh, What a reunion fearful hearts. Especially when his first words were, peace be with you. A statement that he repeats twice more in this passage, verses 21 and then to Thomas in verse 26. Peace be with you. It raises the question, what kind of peace are we actually talking about? Well, it's that peace that comes with God from what Jesus has done at Easter time. Jesus died on the cross. The innocent one was punished in our place so that those who believe in him might be completely forgiven for our sins, totally secure in God's love and assured of salvation. And when we have that kind of love, that kind of assurance, well, it brings peace to our hearts. No wonder Jesus comes announcing peace be with you because the resurrection declares that the cross has been successful, that Jesus has got the job done. And as he stands among his fearful followers, he shows them his hands and his side. The resurrection is the ultimate evidence that Jesus is God's Messiah, the saving king God has sent to rescue the world. And now his followers know that whatever the world might throw at them, they've got the risen Jesus on their side. With him alive, their fear has been turned to peace, peace which overflows to joy. We see that in verse 20, the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. I mean, it must have been a joy to see their friend again, a joy to know that he really is the Messiah they thought he was, a joy to know that he could beat death, that he could most certainly deliver on all his promises to save the world. A few years ago, uh, Heather and I, my wife, uh, we visited Jerusalem, the, the place where all these events took place. And we're actually there at Easter time and, and Passover time for the Jews. So the city was absolutely packed full of religious pilgrims from all over the world. But I remember when I was there feeling a real sense of, of sadness that so many who were there, who'd travelled, who'd saved up to come to this place, seemed to be missing the the peace and the joy that Jesus' actions at Easter, that first Easter, came to bring. 
They were touching special sites, bowing down, kissing various relics, reciting prayers over and over again. It struck me they'd missed Jesus' Easter message altogether. It is finished. Peace be with you. You can experience the eternal joy of a secure relationship with God by trusting in what Jesus has done for you. It's such a contrast to how so many in Jesus' day and so many in our day try to make it to God on their own and through their own religious effort or, or moral performance. And, and all of that, all of that effort comes with a fear, doesn't it? Uh, the fear of, of constantly falling short, of never being able to do enough, the fear of missing out on being part of God's family. On our last day in Jerusalem, Heather and I discovered a place called the Garden Tomb. And it had been set up by some British missionaries a number of years ago who went to Jerusalem to share the gospel with Jews. And this place had a completely different vibe to all those other religious sites in the city. Rather than long queues of people lining up to do their duty, there was quiet space to sit and to pray, to reflect on scriptures that were scattered throughout the garden on signboards. And that actually set up a model tomb there, not as a holy site to worship and touch and bow down, but to be reminded that Jesus' tomb is empty. And the wonderful Easter message which drives out fear and replaces it with joy. He is not here, for he is risen. Now that same peace and joy, the joy of the risen Jesus, is available this Easter to any of us who would put our trust in him. There's so much we can fear in our broken world, the disapproval of others, our own failure, the judgment of God, especially over the past year, we've had all sorts of COVID fears clouding our minds. I don't know what provokes fear for you, but when we challenge our fears with the Easter message of Jesus, that he's died for my sins, that he's risen to guarantee me life forever in God's presence, when my trust is in him, it, it doesn't take away the struggles of life in this world, but it does help us to endure them with peace and joy, peace and joy that can't be found anywhere else. Secondly, uh, the risen Jesus turns doubt into belief. Now, Thomas, he's missed out on this first encounter. Verse 25, the disciples tell him, we've seen the Lord, Thomas. But he says to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. His sceptical mind refuses to believe until he can see and until he can touch Jesus for himself. And so a week later, as the disciples are in the house again, we get almost an identical situation. The doors are locked, but this time Thomas is with them. And Jesus again came and stood among them, and he says, Peace be with you. How does Jesus respond to the doubts Thomas raised? I mean, isn't his demand for proof here a bit presumptuous? It seems to lack a bit of faith. Given what he knows of Jesus, why is Thomas surprised? He surely should have trusted the testimony of his friends that Jesus could rise from the dead. But Jesus responds graciously to Thomas. He provides him the exact proof that he demands in verse 27. Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. He's saying, Thomas, it really is me. I was dead, but now physically... I am alive. I must say, Jesus doesn't promise to handle every doubt that we have like this. We are still often left with unanswered questions. But I think there's something to learn here about the heart of our Saviour. That when we're honest about our struggles and our weaknesses and our doubts, He wants us to bring them to Him. And we can be assured that when we by a gracious response from Jesus. Now, that's his character as we see on display here. Uh, I wonder what kind of doubts about Christianity you find yourself wrestling with. Uh, things like the common ones, what, what about all the suffering in the world? How can you say Jesus is the only way to God? 
Isn't Christianity homophobic or anti-women? Hasn't, hasn't science disproved Christianity? Uh, maybe like Thomas, you have doubts. Uh, how can Jesus actually rise from the dead? Whatever your doubts might be, be open about them with God. Bring them to him in prayer. Let's talk about them with one another. Let's, let's read and research and investigate them. And yet, as we do all of that, Notice Jesus' command to Thomas at the end of verse 27. Stop doubting and believe. In the one statement, Jesus both accommodates and challenges Thomas's doubts. And he says the same thing to us. Stop doubting and believe. A close friend of mine had lots of doubts when he first started coming to church. So for a few years, he came along, he was listening to sermons, he asked lots of questions, he read books dealing with the sort of objections he had to Christian faith. He read the Bible for himself. And after all that, he still had questions. And he told me later, actually, I feel like my personality is I always want more evidence. I'm always questioning. I'm like that with everything in life. I always want more proof. And eventually, there comes a time where I just need to make the best decision on the information available. At this point, he knew he needed to do what Jesus said to Thomas, stop doubting and believe. He had all the information, enough information, to trust Jesus for salvation, and he knew that he would be able to deal with his doubts over time. It was time to to stop sitting on the fence and make a commitment to Jesus, knowing that Jesus would help him work those things out. Now, maybe my friend is like you, You've been investigating Christianity for a while. Yes, you've still got some doubts, but have you discovered enough to say, I know this is true. I know I need to repent for my sin and trust in Jesus as my saviour. Hear Jesus' words, stop doubting and believe. Uh, And as Thomas does this, he gives us these wonderful words in verse 28 that declare his faith in Jesus. He calls out to Jesus, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. Seeing Jesus risen from the dead in light of everything he's witnessed, it's enough for Thomas to take that step of faith. Is that what God is calling on you to do this Easter Sunday morning? And when Jesus, sorry, when Thomas expresses his faith here, it's more than just having a bit of Bible knowledge and going along to church. Thomas's faith here is personal. Jesus, you are my Lord, my God. And that's what it is to be a Christian. It's trusting in what Jesus did at Easter for you so that you would get to receive his gift of forgiveness and eternal life. So that, in other words, verse 29, you get to experience his blessing. See Jesus' words there, "'Because, Thomas, you have seen me, you have believed.'" Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. This is an invitation from Jesus to us all to trust in him as Lord. But we can't physically touch the nail marks in his hand and and the spear scar on his body like Thomas. So what kind of evidence do we have to go off? Well, verses 30 and 31 teach us that we rely on the testimony of the first eyewitnesses of of gospel writers like John and Matthew, Mark and Luke. We don't get to see everything they saw with our own eyes. But verse 20, Jesus did many other signs that didn't fit into this 21-chapter biography written by John. John has chosen to write down these select signs, like the account of the resurrection, that that we would see enough evidence to know who Jesus is. That through God's Holy Spirit, his preserved testimony for 2,000 years, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you might have life in his name. Now, there's lots of strong historical evidence to support the accounts that John and the other gospel writers give us in the Bible, that that Jesus really was a, a real man who lived in history, that he was executed by crucifixion, and that he also rose again physically. I mean, he was seen by more than 500 witnesses at a time. Uh, No body was ever found. Those who saw him were prepared to suffer great persecution 
for sharing their testimony. It's hard to imagine them doing all that for a lie. So unlike Thomas, uh, we won't get our doubts answered by being physically able to encounter the risen Jesus, in this life at least. But if on the basis of the eyewitness accounts in the Scriptures, you'll trust him as your Lord without seeing him physically, Jesus says you'll be blessed. You'll be blessed eternally. You belong to his family and the risen Jesus will turn your fears into peace and joy and he'll move you from doubt to belief. And those are the wonderful implications of what Jesus did that first Easter morning. And empowered by his Holy Spirit, he invites his followers to share that good news of forgiveness and life with the world. Verse 21, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. A few years ago, we hosted a party at our house in Sydney for doubters. Uh, I'm not talking about doubters about Jesus. This was a Thermomix party. And uh, if you don't know what a Thermomix is, it's basically a, a kitchen appliance. And it's all about mixing and baking and blending in one. I still can't use it about seven years later after we bought it. But uh, basically, we had a lady in our church in Sydney, and she was a Thermomix rep. And so Heather invited a whole lot of family and friends over to our house, and I'm sure many of them were sceptical. They were sceptical about making this huge investment, lots of dollars, uh, for this gadget. So Noni, our, our Thermomix consultant, she did a demonstration for us. She showed us all the different features that this thing could, uh, could achieve. She even showed us some different foods it could make, and we got to taste them. And in the end, a few weeks later, we decided we would take the plunge and we'd buy a Thermomix. The question is, how do we move from being sceptics to being believers? Well, on the one hand, it was objective testimony. She showed us what the machine could do and produce in her demonstration. But we also asked around. And we asked people we knew who had Thermomixes, did they regret their purchase? Was it worth it? And did it live up to what it had promised? Now, I'm being a little bit facetious there, but uh, this process with Thermomix of moving from a doubter to believer, I think there's something in that to see the process of moving from doubt to belief in Jesus, to finding eternal life in him. See, there's the objective testimony, isn't there? The scriptures speak to us of what Jesus has done in history. They give us the raw accounts that culminated in his death and resurrection. But there's also the subjective testimony of countless Christians from those first disciples down through the ages to us, to people here in this church at Graceville Presbyterian, to people like Lee Strobel and his wife. We're far from perfect as Christians, but when people in the world look at our lives, it should demonstrate that Jesus really is alive still today that he's at work in us, gradually turning our fears into peace and joy, helping our doubts move to trust in Christ, to the point where we can declare he is my Lord and my God. And empowered by the Holy Spirit, as we carry his message of Easter hope to the world, the risen Lord Jesus continues to transform the lives of people. Skeptics and believers alike find life in his name. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for Jesus, that by believing in him, we can have life forever. We can have the promise of forgiveness for our sins. We can enjoy peace and joy that drives out our fears. And so we pray this Easter morning that you would help us to move from doubt to belief, to put aside those worries that hold us back and embrace Jesus as my Lord and my God. Father, I pray for anyone here this morning who's, who's wrestling with whether to take that step of faith in their life. Help them to grasp onto Jesus, to find their hope in him. And for those who do believe already, Lord, Help us to keep on trusting in Christ. Help us to keep on giving him our fears and experience the peace and joy that comes from trusting in him. We pray this all in his name.
Amén. So in response to uh, what we've heard today, and also as we prepare to approach the Lord's table, let's sing again, praising God's name. Share this 